So I'm Tracy Prater. I'm from NASA Marshall while he's pulling my slides. I work in the materials and processes laboratory and I primarily support these days the in-space manufacturing project which is what I'm here to talk about today. So in-space manufacturing, start my timer here so I can stay on track, is just an umbrella term that really just means manufacturing in the space environment. Uh, we've done some work with 3D printing or additive manufacturing, but it's really an umbrella term and we're not you know, specific to those processes. Uh, so we do a lot of our work with small businesses. I'll try to emphasize that as we go through. When you heard the gentleman talk this morning about commercialization of low earth orbit, we're also actively supporting that through our program. Uh, and I'm standing in today for our fabulous project manager, Nikki Workheiser, who couldn't be here. So our motto is make it, don't take it. And we kind of do public facing talks. We always say our program is you know, trying to build the replicator. So if you're on some deep space mission and something breaks, ideally you would have this manufacturing capability or this whole manufacturing module where you could pull apart from a digital library and make it, or you could give it to Scotty <laughs> to make it for you. Uh, so a lot of people think this is kind of crazy. Um, because it's not what we do right now. We launch everything that's used in space from Earth, but we do see it as potentially transformative, particularly from the perspective of logistics, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So this is what space station looks like in terms of logistics. So space station is 200 miles above the Earth, um, and what happens when something breaks on orbit now is they have orbital replacement units. So say your urine processor simply breaks, you would just pull that unit out wholesale, and replace it with another spare. And so for space station, uh, you know, we do 3,000 kilograms of uh, massive spares per year. Uh, there's also about 18,000 kilograms of spares on the ground ready to fly. Um, so if you extrapolate that to something like a 500-day Mars mission, the number of spares you're going to have to take with you, that becomes a very, um, you know, huge logistic problem for you and almost untenable. So we see in-space manufacturing as one potential solution to that because you're never really going to know what spare is going to fail or when that's going to occur. So ISM is twofold. It's what we make, so what components looking historically across space station operations have a low mean time between failure, have a high mass, where could you be most impactful in terms of using these capabilities, and then it's also what manufacturing processes you use, right? Do you need 3D printing? What kind of materials do you need to have on hand? Um, what about, you know, recycling and in-situ resource utilization? How does that come into play? So what we make and how we make it is very closely coupled. And so we do a lot of work going out and talking to space systems designers, designers of next generation environmental control and life support systems, and looking at where our technologies and what we have in our development pipeline could potentially play into their systems. So everything we're doing now, everything we're talking about here, leads up to this. This is a multi-material fabrication laboratory for Space Station. So we put out the solicitation for this this year. It closed last month, and we'll be making selections hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, but this is, as our project manager likes to call it, your MacGyver box your integrated <laughs> manufacturing capability, you know, that can do metals, um, that can do plastics, that has inline inspection capabilities, automated part processing. Uh, so we're asking for a lot. Uh, we actually have a, a full rack that will be devoted to this. Uh, so it'll be limited to 2,000 watts and about uh, 576 pounds. And we'll talk more about this in detail, but I kind of wanted to put it up front to kind of frame the, the other things in our pipeline that could potentially infuse into this. Okay, so the very first step on our in-space manufacturing journey was in 2014. This is when we launched the first 3D printer to the space station. So what is 3D printing? 3D printing is also known as additive manufacturing. It's layer by layer deposition of material in a controlled manner. And there are different kinds of, you know, it's in contrast to the subtractive machining. Subtractive machining is like a sculptor carving something out of a, a block of stone. So additive is, is kind of the opposite of that. 
Um, but anyway, we launched this in 2014. It uses a process called fused deposition modeling. So if you're familiar with kind of the desktop printers, the MakerBots that you can buy off the shelf, it's the same process as that. Uh, this was done in conjunction with a small business out of Silicon Valley called Made in Space. And so we printed 50, 55 specimens to date in the space environment. We downmassed those, tested them at NASA Marshall in our materials and processes laboratory. We have, we'll have three publications. We have a journal article coming out uh, at the end of this month in Rapid Prototyping Journal. And then another report that'll be coming out on the NASA Tech Report server in December, kind of summarizing and tying up the whole two-year technology demonstration mission. And so what we found is there were some manufacturing process variabilities. There were different settings on the printer when we you know, used it to print before we launched versus how it was operated in the microgravity environment. But there's really nothing that looks like a microgravity effect on this process. I mean, it's essentially like a hot glue gun. So kind of the litmus test is, can you operate this process upside down? If yes, then it's probably not impacted by microgravity. So since that first technology demonstration, we moved on to the second generation printer, which was also done through a small business innovative research opportunity, and that's called the Additive Manufacturing Facility, which was also built by Maiden Space. So this is a commercial facility, and NASA is one of several users for it. But it's really just an upgrade of the previous printer. You can print with three plastic materials, including Ultim, which is a higher temperature, higher strength thermoplastic. And so this is designed to be the utilization printer. So if your program wants to test out how you would negotiate this process flow for an exploration scenario, this is the printer you would use to do that. Um, so we've done some kind of functional prints that actually got used on station that you can see there. The Spears tow hitch uh, is a component that joins two free-flying satellites together on board ISS. People use these satellites to kind of test out guidance navigation and control algorithms. There's also an enclosure for radiation monitors that's printed out of Ultim. That's for the Bigelow expandable activity module. The AUGS adapter down there in the right corner <laughs> Um, actually sits inside an air outlet on a piece of environmental control and life support equipment and kind of helps monitor the health of the hardware by holding a little flow meter. Okay. So our next payload in the pipeline is called the refabricator. And so this will be operational on station in 2018. And it's with a small business out of Seattle called Tethers Unlimited. So this is all about closing the manufacturing loop, right? If you're 3D printing things, you still have to fly the feedstock. So this will be, to my knowledge, the first of its kind. It'll be an integrated printer and recycler. So we'll be able to print a, a part out of Ultim, which is a higher temperature, higher strength thermoplastic, melt it down and re-extrude it into filament for further printing. So with on-orbit operations in 2018, we'll be doing some degradation studies to look at how recycling through those multiple seven cycles and microgravity degrades the material and ultimately determine kind of limitations on what your expected part life would be. Um, but we're pretty excited about that. Okay, and so we're also working in the pipeline on metals manufacturing. So we have a few different projects in that vein. With the small business program, we like to initially fund several companies to work on kind of parallel paths, and then we'll take the one that looks most promising and evolve it into a, a payload, is how we've done some things. Uh, so Maiden Space is developing the Vulcan unit. So this is a wire and arc metal, essentially welding process, but you're using it as a 3D printing process. It's really one of the oldest 3D printing processes out there. And the part that you get out of that is a little crude, so you're gonna need a CNC for part finishing. And operating or developing a CNC mill for microgravity has its own innate challenges, <laughs> um, to say the least, right? You're gonna have debris, they're gonna have to capture somehow. They've actually tested a chip capture system on a parabolic flight. Uh, you're gonna have to do dry machining. You can't be running lubricants through the tool and things like that, so you're gonna get a lot of tool wear. So there's a material challenge there as well. Uh, so looking at, at different avenues to do CNC machining, but you know, if you've ever been in a machine shop, that's your workhorse. If you're gonna run a manufacturing module, you definitely want to have that available. 
So another thing we fund is the ultrasonic additive manufacturing system. So this is a company called Ultratech in Ohio. And this is essentially layers of metal tape uh, that are fused together with sound waves. It's very similar to ultrasonic welding, which is what this kind of evolved out of. Uh, so they're working really hard right now to kind of miniaturize this process. They're looking at a higher frequency sonotrode. Um, another application of this is by miniaturizing it, they can put it on the end of a robotic arm, it could be an effector. Um, so that's another kind of earth-based application. And then the other project we have is also with Tethers and Limited. So this will be able to take virgin or scrap metal form it into an ingot, and then CNC mill it to your finished part. So they're facing a lot of the same challenges with that as Vulcan in terms of developing a CNC mill for space. And then we have another project with TechShot out of Louisville. So that is looking at a 3D printing process for metal, for ferromagnetic metals, because it uses inductive heating. Uh, and so that is in a phase two right now. And so they're trying to develop kind of a prototype flight unit that they could fly on a parabolic flight. So the other thing in our ecosystem that we've recently started working with in the past couple years is additive electronics. So if you look across the history of space station and our operations there, uh, a lot of the failures on station have been electronic in nature. So if you're going to go on a long duration mission, you would probably want to have some capability to repair or manufacture electronics. Uh, so we have a machine at Marshall that we got last year, it's called the InScript. And so it has the ability to print your polymer, it's a multi-head device, so it can print your polymer substrate, lay down conductive traces, and then has a head that can kind of pick and place electronics and do fiducial alignment. Um, and so we're working with some small businesses to take kind of the technologies in that system and potentially develop them as payloads that we can then test out on space station. Uh, and Marshall has also done a lot of work, I don't work in this particular area, on developing the ink materials. They patented a number of new ink materials and then have also done some testing in sensory sensors for those materials. So you can see the printed wireless humidity sensor there. So the other thing that's kind of a challenge, there's a lot of packaging that goes to space station, foam and plastics. And if you look at a material histogram of that, it's kind of all over the board. It's low density polyethylene, it's high density polyethylene, it's PT, which is the stuff that your plastic bottles are made out of. So if you're gonna do this, uh, you know, kind of on a mission, you would want to have one material called just a common use material that you could then take and repurpose into things. So the common use materials is what we're funding through SBRs as well. Uh, so Tethers Unlimited has developed this foam packaging that's 3D printable that you can see in the top right corner. Um, and so it's made from thermoplastic materials. So you would be able in theory, to melt this down, re it as feedstock, 3D print with it. So it's taking what would otherwise be kind of a nuisance material on a space mission that would just get thrown away, you know, down mass to earth, and making it into something that, you know, you could then do something with. Uh, and the Cornerstone Research Group is also working um, with Pink Poly, so taking, you know, the plastic bag materials and then also making new materials with them. So the other area that we've been exploring are the biomedical applications with ISS. So there's a lot of biomedical consumables that get used that you can actually 3D print. Um, the medical industry in general has been an early adopter and early user for 3D printing, so this kind of makes sense. Um, so we've done some autoscope specula, did a senior design project where we looked at 3D printing of cast and comparing that with the SAM splint procedure that you would use if you know, an astronaut were to break a limb on orbit. Um, but this is something that'll be expanded. We're looking at urine funnels now and all sorts of, sorts of fun stuff. Um, but this is the fabrication laboratory. So I talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, but this is really um, going to be a collaboration with industry and academia. We're going to make this selection at the end of this year. Um, so this would be the integrated 16 cubic foot large scale manufacturing system that you're going to test on station. Let's get through these quickly so we have time for questions. Um, you can look at these in the proceedings, but our technology development roadmap, obviously if station deorbits in 2024 or 2028, 
you know, you're going to have to have tested these systems on ISS. You're going to have to be ready to deploy them. So we're really uh, committed to using ISS as a testbed for that purpose. This goes into some more requirements about the fabrication laboratory, which is the payload selection that we'll be making in around December, hopefully. So it should have the ability to do metals. We're really trying to get to a metals capability. Um, a larger build envelope, certainly, than what we, start, what we currently have. Automation is a huge requirement for us. Crew time on station is really scheduled um, down to the minute. So if you have to have an astronaut interact with your system, um, that's kind of a disadvantage. So we're trying to incorporate as much automation as possible into it. And then also inline inspection. So that's the question we always get from designers is if I build something in space, how do I know that it's good? Or right? I don't have a CT scanner, I don't, you know, I'm not doing mechanical testing in space. So trying to look at laser line profilometry and some of those in situ systems that we could also incorporate. We'll skip to that. Um, but I'll take questions since we only have a few minutes left. When you're talking about um, metallic fabrication, is there any thought being given to um, the use of uh, asteroid materials from near-Earth asteroids as feedstock? Yeah, so you can certainly do that. You can actually incorporate kind of regolith-based materials with polymers to make a fiber type filament that you can then extrude. If you think about like basalt rock here on earth, you, which is similar to regolith, you can spin that into a fiber, blend it with a polymer. Um, that process has a large manufacturing footprint right now, but eventually you do get basically a wire feedstock that you can then 3D print with. So yeah, that's, that's possible, yeah. If uh, you had the metal and plastic capability on board the space station today, functioning as it should, do you have any sense of what percentage of spare parts you would not have to keep in stock? So there, I would refer you, there's a number of papers that were published by a grad student who's working under our program. His name's Andrew Owens. He's from MIT and he has a NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship. But he did that kind of logistics analysis. He looked across space station, looked at what had low mean time between failure, what had potentially, you know, more spares on station and where we could be most impactful. Um, valves was, was one of the high ones, O-rings and seals was another one, um, and then electronics were kind of the top three. Okay, thank you.